Hey guys, it's Kylie. I just want to thank you so much for joining us today. We would love to hear about what God is doing in your life. If you have any God stories or need any prayer requests, email us at share at vbf.org. Thank you so much for joining us and we hope you enjoy the message. What's happening? Can you hear me? Yeah. Am I on? Yeah. How you doing? You wake up on the right side of the bed today? Yeah. My grandpa used to tell me that all the time. I'd have, I, you know, my grandparents raised me. I'd wake up to uh, that and then uh, wash a, wash a, brush a, brush a. All right? All that good old stuff. But it's a good day nonetheless, right? For uh, all of you that are new, this is your first time here, I want to thank you so much for just uh, choosing to join us this evening. And we are honored to have you here as our guests. And if you choose to make this your family, you will not regret it. Because uh, y'all clapped early because everybody here is just as messed up, if not more than you are. So we're just on that same journey, amen? Everybody that's watching online, you are very much an extension of our family. We just want to welcome you as, uh, as well. I just want to say this. I was thinking, you know, as, I'm, as you know, the band is finishing up worship, I'm over here on the side. And one of my favorite, favorite uh, movies is, is Rocky, right? All the Rocky films. And then now he's, how, how does he do that? Creed, it's like the same theme but you just still get pumped. Like it gives you the chills, right? Like you're just, I'm on my couch and by the end of the movie, there's indents where I've just like, yeah, suck that guy right, and yeah, you know what I mean? And I'm over here in the side and it's my time to kind of just get in the right headspace. But I just want to come out and say that, that uh, with God, all things are possible. Amen. And uh, whatever it is that you're praying about, don't stop. Don't stop. It's crazy, you know, sometimes we want God to come through right away, but sometimes we give up hope a little too, a little too quickly. Amen? Second thing I wanted to, to uh, say to you guys tonight is, do your neighbors or coworkers or classmates or whoever you're with, do they know that you're a Christian? Would they be surprised if they saw you here in this building? Let's just say they showed up to church, someone else invited them, and they're sitting there, and all of a sudden they look over, and you're just like this, and they're like, I had no idea that that person knew Jesus. We should be sharing the love of Jesus that we have. It says in the Word that his love compels us. We're in the sanctuary, we're just... Right? Some of us are feeling his love. Others, it's not so much. But it's this, this experience, this relationship that we have with God should be shared with those around us. And I know sometimes that's super awkward. We just moved into a new neighborhood. And uh, I'm very, you, believe it or not, I'm very awkward when I meet new people. So like the other, the other day we're out, you know, I'm, my sons were playing in the cul-de-sac. And uh, my neighbor comes over and he, he comes on over. He's like, hey, Bob. And I'm like, hey, Shane. He's like, oh, I just wanted to come over and welcome you to the neighborhood. And I'm like, yeah, it's so good to be here. And there was kind of like this awkward pause. And I was like, uh, pretty cool cul-de-sac, huh? <laughs> and that was it. And he went on his way and I went on mine. And if I'm not that awkward, it's the other way around where it's like the other day there was this guy. He had three boys. He was pushing his cart in the grocery store and I'm there. And he, he sparks conversation. I'm like, in my mind, I'm like, yes, this is my opportunity to like, you know, hey, I know he's going to ask me what I'm doing. But I just go like too far. I'm just like, hey, what's up? My name's Shane. Oh, you're this and that. Hey, what are your fears? What do you fear? Like, oh, too far. Too far. Anyways, take that home with you. Not necessarily my awkwardness, but... Man, do your neighbors, do the people that are closest around you know that you love Jesus? Nothing to do with my sermon. Food for thought. Take that to the bank or wherever you keep your cash. Tonight, as you can see, the title of the sermon is Shaped 
by words. Shaped by words. Let me pray. God, I thank you. Thank you for the privilege and the honor to share your word. God, we all set aside time tonight, God, to come here, Lord. Let us come with expectation. If, no, if some people have come not expecting, God, I pray right now, let us all have a heart of expectation, God, because we need to hear from you. We need to feel you. We need to experience you. We need your wisdom, knowledge, love, peace, joy, hope, faith, boldness. And I pray all those spirits, God, would manifest in the people that need them this evening. And if that is you, say amen. Amen, amen, amen. amen. So I started doing a YouTube dive, which we've talked about up here before. Um, I, I like to get on YouTube. Uh, there's good videos and bad videos. But I, I started watching this video. It's by Dr. Masaru Emoto. And what they were, I'm so sorry where my voice is squeaking like this. Uh, 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 excuse me. What I watched, rather, <laughs> who are these? Ex yeah, yeah. Oh, man, I tell you what, what I was watching, these experiments that this doctor started doing on ice crystals and rice. And basically, the experiments were over the power of words. Basically, um, he took three jars of cooked rice, he sealed them up, and every day for, you know, a period of time, I think it was 10 to 12 days, one jar, he would speak nothing but kind and loving words to it. Maybe you've seen this before. The next jar, he'd speak nothing but hateful words. And the third jar, he completely ignored. And at the, uh, the course of the 10, 12 days after it was done, the, the jar that had the, the rice in it that he spoke loving words to was perfectly fine. For a minute, a little bit, but perfectly the same color as it was when it started. The middle one, where he said words of hate to it, was black. In the jar that had been ignored, it had turned a moldy green color. The point of his experiments were that words have a powerful effect on our physical bodies, on, on the physical realm. His basis is that our bodies are made typically 60 to 70% of water, and so the words that we hear affect us physically. How many know this to be true? And although I don't necessarily agree with his entire theology, the experiments speak for themselves. There's tons of people that have done their own experiments, the same ones, and put their, their uh, videos on YouTube and gotten the same results. But this isn't even something that's, that we've just discovered. We see this in the very first chapter of the Bible. In Genesis 1, 1 through 3, it says this, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was formless and void, and darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was moving over the surface of the waters. Then God said, then God spoke, let there be light, and there was light. Two chapters later, we see the other side of this coin. In Genesis chapter 3, it says, Now the serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made, and he said... To the woman, indeed, has God said, you shall not eat from any tree of the garden. In the New Testament, we see the story of Lazarus, Jesus, his friend. He walks and rolls the stone away from the tomb, and what does he do? Lazarus, come forth. Many people in Jesus' ministry the man who is let down by, through the roof, right? His friends, man, those are good friends that'll tear apart a roof to get you close to Jesus, amen? He said, pick up your bed and walk. He's on the boat, there's raging storm, the disciples are afraid, and what does he do to the storm? He speaks to the storm. It was so crazy thinking of this, this sermon, putting it together. I thought of a time we used to have during the, the high school, during school year, 
out in Station 316, we used to have a, a program on Friday nights called Safe Fifth Quarter, where we would invite everybody after the football games to come, and we'd throw a big party for them. And we were leading worship, myself and, and I think one other person, Seth, he runs our, uh, our tech department back here, and it was like a gnarly dust storm. Like it was, and if you've seen Station, it's like this tin can. And so it was so loud, you couldn't even hear the music in the place. And we were trying to practice worship for the safe fifth quarter. And finally, I was like, forget it. Let's go outside. We're going to rebuke this storm. And we went outside. And I don't, I'm not saying that I'm, you know, this person, if you, you have bad weather in your area, call Shane. I'm not saying that whatsoever. I'm just saying we went out. And we weren't afraid to look like fools, although it was just Seth and I. And we prayed and we rebuked this storm. And wouldn't you know it, it started going the other directions where we could physically and literally see the clouds go in the opposite direction where we were. We see this, that God created words to be powerful. In Proverbs 18, 21, it says this, death and life are in the power of the tongue and those who love it will eat its fruit. That's some powerful stuff, right? But think about this. For something that holds so much power, why do we give such little of thought to it? I'm with you in this boat. Again, I'll always say, I'm, I'm on the same road as you guys. If anybody's got some issues with letting their mouth just fly off the handle, it's me. I heard a pastor say once that it's kind of like holding grains of our words. We, we look at it much like holding a handful of sand. We don't really pay too much mind to the grains that fall through our fingertips. Something so powerful, but yet we don't think it's that important. We say, ah, that's just who I am. Ah, that's just how I was raised. It's a part of my character. I know may, many of you have maybe heard this statistic before, but it's said that most of us speak about 16,000 words per day. That's equivalent to about a 60-page book. I started thinking about this. What would the theme of my autobiography be on a daily basis? What would the theme of your book, your 16,000 words on a daily basis, at the end of the day, it'd probably look a little different on some days, some, on church days, it'd have a different theme, right? But for the majority, what kind of library of books do you have in your hypothetical library at home? Would it be, hey, you're Tim the encourager. That was, that's, that was the, the theme of your autobiography of the day. Or maybe you're Shane the grumbler. <clears throat> that's me or what about maybe you're Mary the critic oh my goodness how many people we, I just got caught up in being a critic today we went to a new coffee shop and when we were leaving on our way home I started just going off about how they could have done this better they didn't really think about this man they could totally save money if they did this or why did they have to use the paper straw right my goodness, one turtle video of getting a straw stuck in his nose, did that turtle didn't even know that he would change the world now that we got paper straws. Maybe it's uh, Bob the pervert is the theme of your autobiography. Maybe it's Dan the jokester or Renee the negative Nancy. Something to think about, but I very rarely do. See, the words that come out of our mouths are writing a story about who we are and who we're living for. And believe it or not, other people are reading our story in real time. It's tough, right? This one hurts. It hurts me. I, I prayed all week, Lord, you really want me to talk about this? Because I don't want to be a hypocrite but I really feel like it's time to start minding my words. James 3, 1 through 12 says this in the Message Bible. Don't be in any rush to become a teacher, my friends. Teaching is highly responsible work. Teachers are held to the strictest standards. Scary stuff. 
And none of us is perfectly qualified. We get it wrong nearly every time we open our mouths. If you could find someone whose speech was perfectly true, you'd have a perfect person in perfect control of life. A bit in the mouth of a horse controls the whole horse. A small rudder on a huge ship in the hands of a skilled captain sets a course in the face of the strongest winds. A word out of your mouth may seem of no account, but it can accomplish nearly anything or destroy it. It only takes a spark, remember, to set off a forest fire. A careless or wrongly placed word out of your mouth can do that. By our speech, we can ruin the world, turn harmony to chaos, throw mud on a reputation, send the whole world up in smoke and go up in smoke with it. Smoke right from the pit of hell. This is scary. You can tame a tiger, but you can't tame a tongue. It's never been done. The tongue runs wild, a wanton killer. With our tongues, we bless God our Father, and with the same tongues, we curse the very men and women he made in his image. Ouch. Curses and blessings out of the same mouth. My friends, this can't go on. A spring doesn't gush fresh water one day and brackish the next, does it? Apple trees don't bear strawberries, do they? Raspberry bushes don't bear apples, do they? You're not going to dip into a polluted mud hole and get a cup of clear, cool water, are you? In other translations, in verse 6, it says this, that our tongues set on fire the course of our life. See, most of us, if not all of us, have been shaped or are currently being shaped by the words of others. We, in turn, are shaping others with our words. See, words are like seeds. They grow roots inside of us, whether we hear them or we're giving them. And those roots begin to become beliefs. Are you following me? And those beliefs, in turn, become our identity. Are you hearing me, church? There's some of you that you think your identity is something only because somebody's been telling you that for your entire life. We see this as an example. We see when a father is abusive to his son. And in turn, that son treats his son, who in turn treats his son, and so on and so forth. But I want to talk about a few different ways that words impact our lives and the others around us. My first point is this. What have we allowed others to speak into our lives? What have we, do you know that you allow? They're not just, it's not their right. You, you're the one that allows others to speak into your lives. Some of us have been set on a trajectory in life by the words of our parents, or parent, or lack of words, right? Proverbs 4, 23 says this, watch over your heart with all diligence, for from it flow the springs of life. Some of us in this room were lucky enough to be raised by good parents. We were taught, right? We were taught that education was of value. We were taught good work ethics. We were taught manners, self-worth, responsibility, the importance of family, and we had a good balance of discipline and love, but there is others of us in this room that were raised by parents who attacked us with their words. Words like this, you spoiled brat. You're stupid. That was so stupid. Why did you do that? Get away from me. You're bugging me. You're annoying me. Go play in your room. You never do what I tell you. You never get it right. You never dot, dot, dot. Or you always make me mad. Or you always dot, dot, dot. No affirmation. Nothing but discipline. For others of us, nothing was said to us at all from our parents. Somebody told me one time with my parenting, with my boys, 
Because I can fall so victim of, of using my, my mouth as a weapon that things that are broken can be replaced. Things that are broken can be replaced. For those of you that have kids, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Sometimes, you know, my boys, they'll make messes. I'm a, I don't want to say I'm a clean freak because I'm, I'm not a clean freak. I'm just, I like things organized. I was raised by my grandparents. We had a room you couldn't touch. I mean, it's not my fault, right? Right? <laughs> Some of the phrases that I remember as a child, clean that dish, don't leave that dish in the sink. Right? No singing at the dinner table. I couldn't sing at the dinner table. I couldn't sing at the dinner. We sat at the dinner table like it was like hush time. I got the fork in the hand if I, I got out of line. Anybody get the fork in the hand growing up? Anybody? Oh, just me? I guess I should have called me and, me and you, buddy. Nobody thought to call CPS back then, I guess. <laughs> Some of us grew up and we never, we never heard the words, I love you. Guys, this resonates with us a lot, right? For some of you, your dads, he loved you in different ways, right? The love was shown in different ways. But the words, the words that hold power, that I love you, I'm proud of you, good job, you're important. We see the effects of these upbringings when we see people that latch on to relationships expecting that other person to fill that void that they cannot fill. Can I speak to you? If you're in a relationship and you're damaged from your past, I'm so sorry. That is a long road to walk down. I've been down that road. But man, the person, whoever you're going to be with that God's going to provide you with, that person is not meant to fill that void for you. God is, right? It's so crazy. Uh, again, don't get me wrong. My, my home life is far from perfect. My wife will tell you this. But my son, Parker, who I obviously I always talk about, my five-year-old son, I always, you know, when you go to bed at night, we say our prayers, do all the thing, and I'll, I'll lean over to both my sons and I'll say, I'm proud of you, I'm proud of you. I'm proud of you. And my par uh, Parker, will, my Parker, he'll say, I'm proud of you too, Dad. The other day, Graham, he's my, th he's my soon to be three year old. He's, you know, trying to get him to brush his teeth is like the hardest thing in the world, right? My wife has literally had to tell him that monsters are going to come and snatch his teeth away if he doesn't. Talking about the power of words, that boy's like, a monster, get my teeth? Let's brush those things. Well, anyways, he, he, the other day I'm trying to get him ready and he's giving me a hassle and he finally came in. And then Parker comes in and he goes, like, I'm proud of you, Graham. I'm proud of you, Graham. And I'm just like, <clears throat> But that resonates with him, those seeds that I'm planting in him. And don't get me wrong, man, I, I get convicted because sometimes I don't use my words that great, right? On the way here, we had, a, we had another form of this incident. I was singing this song, and my wife, yeah, she, is, uh, she is beautiful and she is talented, but sometimes I'll sing in, in goofy ways, and she's looking at me in the car, and she's like, she, Parker, Parker goes, Daddy, I love your song. And Carissa is like, I was just looking at the ugly face that you were making while that. And Parker goes, oh, how dare you say that? <laughs> I love it. But some of us, our lives, we, we, we are on a trajectory trajectory of life. We've been on since we were kids because of the, the words that our parents spoke to us. Our identity has been formed by some things that our parents have told us. Others, it's a spouse or a boyfriend or girlfriend. Maybe it's a past relationship. Some of the things that have been said in your relationship is affecting you. It affected you then and it's even affecting you now and will continue to cause chaos in every relationship because you're gonna take that seed, that word that was spoken over you by that person into every relationship until you realize that that is not a truth, that that was the, a word or the, the sentence, an opinion by one person and one person only, and you are the one that chooses to let that word define you. You gotta let it go. When Chris and I first got married, I was one that I, I used to be in a verbally abusive relationships where, you know, you get in the fights and then you just let the words fly, right? 
You gotta defend yourself, but then it doesn't become a defense anymore in your relationship, then you're just like, you're the one on the attack. I was always taught, always throw the first punch. That's how I was taught. You know, you, you, you're in high school, you get, you know, get picked on, you don't wanna get hit, anybody ever been hit? It ain't fun. So I always got taught you hit first. That crossed over in the verbal department too. And when Chris and I first got married, I found myself when we get in an argument, I just start lashing out verbally. And we had to sit down and, dis and discuss and set boundaries of saying, we can disagree, but we will never attack each other with our words. For others of us, it isn't relationships at all. It's the things that we allow to speak into our lives like music and movies and media. And don't get me wrong, I'm not trying to be legalistic up here. But some of you are dealing with anger and hate and bitterness. And you're listening to music that's telling you to give anybody who doesn't think like you the middle finger. It makes sense that you can't get past that. Some of you are dealing with, with lust and perversion and things of that nature, and you wonder why it's still a struggle, and yet you're, you're Netflix and chilling watching Game of Thrones. I, dude, I, I would love to watch that show. I watched the first episode, and I was like, oh my goodness. I had to tell Chris, I said, I'll watch this episode. <laughs> I did. And then I waited a few months and I was like, man, maybe the next one's not gonna be like that. And so I went to the second episode and I was like, oh no, done. Sometimes the things that we want, I would love to watch Game of Thrones. And again, I'm not being legalistic, but sometimes if we wanna get past something, if we wanna transform the way that we think, we gotta watch what's speaking to our minds. Man, I don't know about you, dude, but I don't even really like social media anymore. I don't, it's, it's negative. And half of it's not even true, but it feeds my mind to where I start feeling things. I'll start, I'll read something somebody posted and then after I get off and I'm like, man, what's that, what's that person thinking? Matthew 15, 11 says this, I have to hurry. It is not what enters into the mouth that defiles the man, but what proceeds out of the mouth this defiles the man in Romans 12, two through three. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your what? So that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. The great news is that we no longer have to be shaped by the things that people in our past and in our life have said to us. First Peter 1 Peter 1.3 says this, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And 2 Corinthians 5.17 says this, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things have passed away. Behold, the new things have come. I said this earlier, but words are like seeds. The words that we've allowed to be sown into our lives, those are the things that we're reaping. Isaiah 43, 19 says this, behold, I will do something new. God says, I'm going to do something new in you. Now it will spring forth. Will you not be aware of it? So we're no longer in, in, in Christ. We're on a new road if we choose to be that way. But we gotta start being mindful of who we let speak into our lives. So that way we are not shaped by words, but we are shaped by the word. Amen? Amen. But unfortunately, I love this section over here. This is the clapping section. Five more minutes. The unfortunate thing is that we've all allowed words to be sown into our life that is not good, and therefore, it's kind of dictated the way that we sow words. The second point is this, what are we speaking into others' lives? I told you guys, uh, I think it was Sunday before last, or maybe it was last Sunday, you know, this, this boy picked on Parker at school, uh, sitting there and at home and Parker had his shirt off and he said something about his, he's like, oh, I don't want them to see my big belly. 
I said, who said you had a big belly? He said, this kid at school said I had a big belly. Five years old. I was like that in school. I was like that in grade school. And then when I got to high school, first couple years, guys, you know, picking on you. You got bullies. You had bullies then. You have bullies now. And then I made out with all the girlfriends, and we made it even. <laughs> but I realized that because of the way that I was, I was raised in school, you know, I, I broke my hand like twice in grade school, thumping dudes in the, in the head because they were picking on me. But then I realized even when I got into high school and out of high school, even with my group of friends, that I, 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 man, I talk more mess to my friends, even now, even today. That's why this message is convicting for me. I talk more mess to my friends than I do uplifting, but I think it's okay because we all have a laugh about it. But I'm not realizing that probably there are some seeds that are being implanted in there that I don't realize. I realize that the things that come out of my mouth are not very uplifting sometimes. And what's more, what we say about other people to their face, what about what we say about other people behind their backs to a group of other people, right? Did you know that you shape the way other people see people by talking about them behind their backs? Have you ever formed an opinion about somebody you've never met only because you've heard about them in a group? All the time. All the time. We see it all the time. How are you speaking to and about your kids? Shaping their life. How are you speaking to and about your spouse? It's shaping their lives. Your friends, leaders, co-workers, classmates, neighbors. We're either building or destroying with our words. Ephesians 4.29 says this. Let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only such a word as is good for edification according to the need of the moment, so that it will give grace to those who hear. In Proverbs 15, 4 says this, a soothing tongue is a tree of life, but perversion in it crushes the spirit. And lastly, because I'm almost out of time, my third point is this, what are we speaking into our own lives? See, we can be our own worst critics influenced by the words of others that we've allowed to speak into our lives and then again those words have become beliefs and easily become our own that I'm not good enough, I'm not pretty enough, I don't make enough money or I'm not smart or talented enough and these beliefs they stifle us and they stop us from being effective in society, relationships and in ministry. It puts a wedge between us and God because our view of ourselves, the words that we allowed to penetrate and create beliefs and identity in us, we sometimes, we believe ourselves more than we believe what God says about us. Words are powerful. Words are powerful. Psalms 141.3 says this, set a guard, O Lord, over my mouth. Keep watch over the door of my lips. So here's what I want you to leave here with. Time flew by. I don't know if I got on stage late or what. But we have to start speaking life into others and ourselves. Isaiah 55, 11, it says this. So will my word be which goes forth from my mouth. It will not return to me empty. We have to start speaking life, the word of God, over ourselves and over others. So here's your challenge. Okay, you're going to take this home. Any of you guys want to do these challenges with me? The first one is this. This is speaking to yourself. Some of us, we need to transform the way that we think about ourselves because of what others have said. So when you think that you're not good enough, you need to read Psalms 119, 13 through 14 that says this. With my, with my lips I have told of all the ordinances of your mouth. I have rejoiced in the way of your testimonies as much as in all riches. No, that's... Well, Maybe I meant 139, forgive me. But it says that I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. When you feel like you're not good enough, you need to read the scripture. I believe it's Psalms 139, I apologize, back room, that says I am fearfully and wonderfully made, that God knows every part of my being. When you feel alone, you need to read Deuteronomy 31.6. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or tremble at them. For the Lord your God is the one who goes with you, and he will not fail you or forsake you. And when you feel like you're afraid, I 
Isaiah 54, 17 says this, no weapon that is formed against you will prosper. And every tongue that accuses you in judgment, you will condemn. We got to speak the word of God over our lives to transform this thing. The second is this. I thought it was so awesome. I saw a video where this lady, she was part of an organization. She said when she was little, her mother used to leave notes for her, kind notes everywhere on her door and her bathroom mirror inside the pantry. And she had all these notes that she saved up from that when she was little that she still had from her mom. But if you have kids, if you have other loved ones, spouses, if you have coworkers, leaving notes of encouragement for them. This is my challenge. Go home and do this. Words are powerful. You never know who needs those notes. And last is send texts. If you don't want to leave notes and you're not into penmanship and things of that nature, we're all digital age now. Send an encouraging text every day. You never know. The ministry we miss because we don't move. Mm. Let me pray. God, I don't want to be a hypocrite up here. You know me. So I pray that you would give us all the conviction of your Holy Spirit to be mindful of the words that we use. Because going, going back, God, people are reading the books that we're writing with our words. We can profess to be Christians, but then our, our mouth and the things that come out of it man, can tell a completely different story. I confess, God, I confess that I'm a critic, that I'm a complainer, a grumbler, that I spew gossip and, and, and slander sometimes, God. Help me to be mindful of my words. God, for those in this room that have been damaged by the words of other people, whether it's parents or spouses or uh, relationships or media or whatever it is, God, I pray that you would begin to heal them. God, let them know that your word, that what you think about them outrides what we think about ourselves or what other people have said about us. That we are fearfully and wonderfully made, that we are called with a purpose. That you loved us enough to send your son to die for us. Those of us that have felt unworthy, those of us that have felt stupid, God, you sent your son to die for us. Those things are just things that people have said about us. It's not who we are. We are new creations. We have a new life in you. And you have greatness planned for us, God. So God, heal those people that are struggling with those, those words. We love you, God. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would fall on these people powerfully. And that they would take the love, God, that they feel from you that they experience in these moments. And they'd go share it with the world. We love you, God. We praise you. We give you all the glory in Jesus' name. Everybody said amen, amen and amen. Thank you again. It's been a privilege. You guys drive safe. Go tell people about the Lord. Amen.